So, all right, so uh, moving on now to uh, the next part of our program, wrapping up uh, the, uh, the, the day today, we're gonna hear from one of our members, um, James Gaspard from Biochar Now, who is going to uh, tell you about what they are doing in, um, in the biochar world. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a totally different crowd presenting to today. Uh, last weekend, I presented at a conference at 10,000 cannabis and hemp growers. So today, we actually made it to lunch where I heard, dude, or bro. <laughs> so it's a different crowd. I know, they didn't, yeah. No, but it's great. But uh, appreciate the invitation to speak with you. Uh, basically, Biochar now, we've been doing this now, this company, for about seven years. Okay, and um, we're a totally different company. If you Google biochar, you'll have over a million hits. And over 90% of that stuff is snake oil, and it's just, you know, it's pretty scary what's out there on the internet. But, you know, especially for those people who believe everything on the internet's real. Uh, we're basically, we have a, all the certifications. We had to patent our own system for production. We, we make basically a high quality carbon. Uh, if I had to go back and do it all over again, I would have never called my product biochar. But at the time, I didn't know the industry was such a wild, wild west. Um, we're actually the only biochar that's formally approved by the US, US EPA to even release our product in the environment. So that kind of tells you the status of the industry when you got all these people claiming they're doing this, that, and the other thing. And we're actually the only one that's formally approved. And it's probably because most of them don't even know you're supposed to have approvals, but that's another story. Uh, we're in a lot of different markets, and this presentation is for water treatment and algae treatment, okay? So we have different size products for different markets. This is a size product that we use in our water application. As this is what our product starts to look like, electron microscope. We make it out of softwood. You can make it out of anything. We can make it out of hardwood, whatever. But for water treatment, pine or any softwood is best because when you get to the electron microscope level, you'll see there's a lot of macro pores for large organic molecules. If you make char out of hardwood or nutshells or stuff, it just won't clean up certain water pollutants because they just won't fit in the pores. So our product basically is extremely clean. Uh, what makes, it what makes it work in the water is we do a slow paralysis system. And we heat it at over 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit in a vacuum environment for over eight hours. So what we do is we literally transform, we blow out all the tars and lignans and everything in there and we transform the uh, cellular structure into a graphene type structure. And we impart upon the wood the cation exchange property. So you can think of us as a, basically a, a, the easiest in this market would think of us sort of like as activated carbon or activated charcoal, but we have a cation exchange property on top of that. So we'll, we'll bind up molecules that the activated carbons won't touch. And for a second, and I'll explain for the second life of the char, uh, we basically, we are home for microbes and stuff, but I'll get to that in a minute. For phosphorus, we remove 99.9% .9 of the phosphorus we come in contact with. That's something that most carbons won't do. We also can take up nitrates and ammonias and things like that, but for the algae removal, that's what's important for our, at least our application in algae removal. The nitrates will evaporate eventually, okay? But phosphorus bioaccumulates. So until you get the phosphorus actually out of the system, you're just gonna have the legacy phosphorus you, you were talking, everybody spoken about earlier. Uh, we also hold almost six times our weight in water. So I sell my product by volume because if you, most of the stuff you buy on the internet is selling you by a pound, they're, they're shipping you water. And their, their pores are all plugged with tars and lignans, most of them. Um, we also take up heavy metals. Not on this, I mean, so we do mine reclamation work. We actually have a patent uh, cleaning up mine water. So, but that's not this conference. Uh, we also, not on this list, we sorb mercury, more effective than we're doing a major project with DuPont, and uh, we're cleaning up uh, the South River. 
which is here in this part of the world, and, and mercury pollution South River, the Shenandoah River, to the Potomac River. So you're not supposed to eat fish anywhere for 300 miles. But we're being used to sort the mercury out of the river uh, for, with DuPont. And we also sort PCBs, uh, dioxins, pharmaceuticals, things that aren't on the list. But we've got the testing to show we sort those things as well. Now, we're not a miracle worker. I mean, you know, like lithium, I mean, I only sort 39% of that. So you don't want to use me to clean up lithium, unless you can't find anything better. But, uh, you, know, we're not, we're, you know, we're not the fit for everything. But for algae blooms, we do work. What, what you do, I'll get to the photos here in a minute. This was one lake I was just going to mention legacy phosphorus on. This was a couple hundred acre lake. We put socks in there, uh, pulled the phosphorus out, and then the chart went down to pull the phosphorus, and then it had a massive spike. What happened, and then it pulled it out again. What happened with the massive spike was all the muck at the bottom remineralized. So the legacy phosphorus went back in the water and we pulled that out. It's a very simple system. We just literally put the biochar in socks, hang the socks in the water column, and let the wind move it through. Now, if you have an aerator, fine, it moves it quicker. But it's pretty simple. You can't get much simpler than that. Uh, and as the water moves through the socks, uh, it pulls the phosphorus out. It pulls other things, but the phosphorus is what's the important thing here. We have received the patent on this system. Uh, and then you just add more. We're, you know, we've, my, I sell to lake treatment customers, right, the lake treatment companies. And we've done about, I think, we're probably getting close to 100 lakes so far, but we don't publicize what we do. And those customers don't pub, or my customers don't publicize. This is the first meeting I've been in, any kind of water treatment organization, even let them know what we're up to. I mean, just today we shipped to two more reservoirs. So the word's getting out among the, the lake management community anyway. And then you take the bags out and that removes, removes the phosphorus out of the water, and you put more in, just continue the cycle till it's done. All right, here's the Dairy Lagoon, uh, you know, cleared it up in three days. My problem as a capitalist is I can't, you know, it doesn't take much. I mean, I clean this, we clean this thing up for less than $200 in product. There's a lake in Denver area, uh, it's a reservoir. I suggested they put five times more of my product in it than they did. So he decided he put $700 worth of product in there and cleared up a blue-green algae bloom in three days. Completely, completely cleared it up. What he did, the mountains were over here, so he just put socks here. Instead of putting socks throughout the lake, he just put socks there because the prevailing winds push it that way. And the water made it through the socks in a couple of days, and that was it. So you see how the layout was? It's a pretty simple thing. We just literally put our char in a flow-through mesh, just drop it in the water with the float, and you put a weight at the other end where it just suspends in the column. That's it, you can't get much more low-tech than that. And then you just go pull the socks back out and, you know, once the algae bloom disappears, and you work your product back into the landscaping. And that's where we basically, the cost effectiveness comes from. As I sell it to the customer, we'll either take the product back and resell it. I have two national lawn care companies that I sell to. I sell to a lot of specialty ag people, but the lawn care companies, first thing they do is rip the bag open and pour fertilizer on it and then work it into landscaping. So this way we're just naturally loading the char up with the nutrients and putting it back in the environment where it's supposed to be. Now we have studies that show our char will not rinse out any of the nutrients. So we've put hundreds of inches of filtration water through the char and it won't leach the nutrients. The nutrients are attracted by the plant roots through the cation exchange property in the plants. So you literally just put the char out there. You could do reservoirs. I'm negotiating with some major cities in, the, in California. The idea being if they can put the bags out there, they can do a marketing program with their local you know, people to buy a bag, once you pull it back out, put it in your garden, your home garden, and they make, they can actually make money on cleaning up their mess. A couple of quick studies to show you the benefit on the secondary market. So the idea is you put it out, you pull it back, and what are you going to do with it? 
you can give it back to me and I'll sell it, or you sell it yourself. And the benefits of the char, this was a Cornell study done. You know, now I admit they did it in poor soil, so if you're gonna spike the results, the results of a study, pick the poorest, you know, the worst result, the worst soils. They planted three plots of maize. One, no fertilizer, no biochar, it was a clay soil, had no nutrients in it, and was rinsed out every day, no crop. You add commercial fertilizer, it produced a crop. You put 10% biochar in the root zone to bind the nutrients and the water in the root zone, they realized an 880% yield over the fertilizer crop. So we're not doing anything special, we're just binding up the nutrients and holding it in the root zone and keeping it from washing through. This was a study done by uh, Morton Arboretum on uh, urban trees in Chicago. You can see the biochar. In this case, they just threw it on the ground. They didn't even bother to work it into the soil. And you know, they just let the winos and the earthworms figure out a way to get it down. But, uh, and as I said, we have two of the top four lawn care companies we sell to currently and provide their char nationally. This was a test that was done just uniquely that I like. We actually suppress diseases. Um, there's been a lot of papers written on how this is done. You know, I don't believe any of them, but I think we just make the plants healthy enough we grow through the disease. Uh, Rice University thinks we scramble the microbial signals of the viruses and the bacteria where they won't attack the plant. But either way, you pull up those plants, the roots are still rotted away. And we also, uh, we can be used to remediate mine, mine pot tailing piles or, you know, if you had phosphorus piles or whatever, we just bind up the stuff on the surface and keep it from going. This was Aspen's water supply. This was a creek. This was an old tailing pile over 100 years old. If you visited Aspen five years ago, I don't even want to tell you what you were drinking, but you're okay now. But the... Uh, you know, it was leaching stuff that, you know, it just, it was bad. And we bind this stuff up now, and the grass was an afterthought. But it's a very simple concept. We've done many large lakes. We're doing larger lakes. Um, you know, we're ready to step up to very, very, very large projects. We have the uh, market on the other side for the char. So that's where we're at. We can literally clean up a Lake Okeechobee or something like that for pennies on the dollar, but given we're capitalists, we'll take what we can get. Any questions? Uh, you showed the removal efficiency for phosphorus. What, um, how effective is it with nitrate? Oh, it, I believe it was in the, let's go back, 60s or 70s. Well, it depends. The ammonia was 89.7, nitrates was 64.3. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, but the nitrates, I mean, that'll eventually evaporate. That's what I'm told. Now, you guys have more science in this area than I do. Data slide with the starting uh, milligrams per liter of 284 for the orthophosphate, the middle row, left side. Yeah. Uh, do you have a handle on what the absorptive capacity of the biochar is at that? That's a problem too. We haven't reached breakthrough yet. The uh, Corps of Engineers was trying to do some breakthrough studies because they want to use this at military bases, and uh, they couldn't get the breakthrough. Um, what I do is recommend my clients swap them, swap socks out every six months or a year. They haven't listened to me yet. We've got one filter that's been uh, uh, in the water for five years so far and it's still sorbing. That's another problem why I haven't chased this market much. <laughs> We've done some work with biochar and in fact we're working with biochar right now as far as removing bacteria from solutions. So when you go into these lakes, I mean, certainly nutrients are an issue, but there's likely pathogens or at least indicator mm -hmm. organisms. Yeah. Is there any interest in, in looking at that plus on kind of that'd be the, the benefit, but then the downside would be you take these socks that now have potentially have elevated concentrations of E. coli, what have you, 
people plant put this in their garden or in their you know vegetable crops are you is there any concern or has it been there any work that uh, maybe you're transferring yeah to answer your question the school of mine oh, colorado school of mines because i know there's other school of mines in other states um they've actually done work for denver water show we're more cost effective at absorbing e coli than their uv radiation system um, but what they're doing there is they're doing biochar filters at the, like in the Platte River where the runoff comes from the city and the dog, you know, goes by ag areas. So they're just leaving it in situ. They haven't pulled it back out yet. But the one thing that I would mention is like micro, what's in the blue green ant? Micro, micro cystin. Yeah, studies have been done because yeah, when we pull the socks back out. We've, we've sorbed all that. That totally disappears out of the water. But they've discovered if you just leave the char uh, sitting there after, after so many days, everything's dead. How does this work? You can remove both metal ion and also phosphate. Is that? And the example I cannot see very clearly, you can remove yeah. Look, like uh, cad cadmium. Yeah. We, all I can tell you is we do a different process than anyone else. It's a slow paralysis at extremely high temperature in a vacuum mm -hmm. for like eight hours. And it's one of those things like you remember the T-shirt and you had a formula over here and then a miracle happens and you have a result. I can't even tell you why our stuff does what it does. I mean, I mean, uh, we, we've been trying to study it and universities have been studying it. It just it pulls the stuff out. I, 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 think, I think the science, we know more about what Yeah. Some microsites, some heterogeneities, and you know, there's various mechanism, mechanisms that have been proposed. Yeah, no, and, and we make it differently than other people, and we're at a temperature above where other people do for a lot longer and in a vacuum versus a non vacuum. All right, so uh, we're going to move on, though. Uh, thank you, James. James Thank you. Around and